So you're joining me again at Barston Lakes. We love coming here because it's a very obliging fishery. There's tons of fish and there's different species. There's skimmers and there's F1s and there's carp. And we're down in the 80s, which is known as the grassy mound because that's one of the best pegs as well. So we're going to talk to you today about feeder fishing with a slightly different slant. Unusually for us, we don't try and talk to you about our products, but today we're going to talk to you about one of our products because we're that pleased with it. We're actually filming with it. So we're going to show you how we feel about it. So welcome to this video about Detection Line. So today I'm going to walk you through everything from the way that we approach this venue, uh, why we do that and the reactions we get from the fish. So Barston is quite a shallow lake where we are today, um, starts off it's probably only two or three foot in the edge and it doesn't really get much deeper, uh, especially in this area until you get right the way the other side. So that's a little bit of knowledge obviously I have, um, but we're going to plumb it up anyway just to walk you through that and show you. Um, but we wouldn't be able to reach the deep water because it's probably over 100 metres uh, away. We could reach it, but why would you want to do that when you can catch the fish and get them to come to us? That would only be for a match situation. So we'll start off with um, plumbing the depth and then we'll talk to you why we're using the feeders, what bait we're going to do, because we're going to target skimmers and hopefully a few F1s on a short line. Uh, and then we're going to go to what I would consider to be a, a mid-distance line where we'll probably fish a method feeder with pellets or a, a banjo style feeder and we'll hope to catch F1s, odd big bream and maybe a few bonus carp and then we'll feel our way through the rest of it and during all that um, one of the reasons why we're actually here today is because we're just putting this the finishing touches to this new line that we've got and it's the attributes of that product that lend themselves to this kind of fishing and I suppose this kind of fishing is what's gone into the development of that product which is a new detection line uh, and as we're fishing and we'll highlight the points of that and I'll tell you how we got there why we got there and the experience from our team of anglers that we put in to uh, putting all those different elements into this great new product so we're going to try not to uh, bore you to tears with some of the finer details which is the tackle bait preparation and the things that you're going to see on just about every single video we do like how we thread his rods up and so but if you do want to look at that in depth just watch the clip further down the video towards the end where we'll do all the detailed stuff that if you want to look at you can find it there so let's get plumbed up and map out the swim as they say um, but before I just go you know casting the bomb everywhere I just want to kind of talk you through the principles of it and I'm just going to under and cast that so that I can actually show you what I'm doing. So as that bomb hit the water, I've actually trapped the line against my, my reel like that. So that as the bomb hits the water, everything's tight. And I'm watching the tip. And what I'm watching for is the, the time it takes from the bomb in the water to the bomb in the bottom. And by watching your tip, like that, boom, there it goes. So it's quite shallow. And the reason I've done that underhanded is it's a better because you're not casting it over and the bomb's not traveling as fast so you can just uh, for me to explain to you how that works so that'll be done a little bit faster when we actually go plumb into what i think we need to be so we're not going to go too far today and we're going to pick ourselves a far bank marker in this instance it'll be that mast and i've chucked what's a nice comfortable cast now that was almost instant and that's a great example to you to just talk about depth because we could talk about plumbing the depth all day and the, how fast the bomb travels and all the rest of it. But as that bomb hit the water, very quickly, because it's travelling at speed because I've cast it over hand, it's bump, bump, like that. Now, we've, we've just done it short, so we know there's some depth, and I think it's about three foot. But when you cast further out, it will appear that there were no depth. So some people will say, well, is that shallower then? Because it didn't take as long for it to to hit the bottom. No, it's because the bomb is travelling at a greater speed. So what we try and do is slow it down, like so, bump, there you go. And that took twice as long for the bomb to hit the water. And that's because as the bomb was travelling through the air, I've just gently applied pressure to the edge of the reel to slow the line down so that when the bomb touched the water, it was travelling at a lot slower speed. That means then that it falls through and you can read your tip. That's about the distance I want to be and it's three foot, and we know that from what we've just proved with what we've been doing. 
Now the next thing is I'm going to set my clip, so I put my clip on, and then I'm just going to check the bottom. And that's actually feels quite what I call bobbly, because you can feel the bomb travelling over the hard bottom. And that's a great surface to fish on. It's synonymous here with um, soft bottom and silt. Like most commercial fisheries are, um, silt gathers over the years, and when you're fishing on silt, it can sometimes cause you problems because the fish, uh, you're ploughing bait into that silt, fish are disturbing it, you're disturbing it, and they're pushing your bait further and further into the silt, and I think what happens is they get lost because the reds are in the silt, they can't see your bait. So we just checked for the bottom, uh, what the material is, you know, the, what the bottom consists of, and that's, not, that's nice and hard. So then we're going to cast a little bit further and just set our uh, middle rod. So with our middle distance rod, we're just going to plumb the depth. And that's set up with an inline um, feeder on it. So I've just whipped that off and put an inline bomb to allow us, great little system that is, just to allow us to plumb the depth. And this is, because you know we've already spoke about how deep it is here, we basically know that it's not particularly any deeper further out. So I've just casted that out as much as anything to get a feel of where it might land when we do pick it up. Because we don't want to start, if we think there's some fish there, we don't want to start crashing it in and pulling up the depth and so on and so forth. So we're just going to have a little chuck and sure enough, you know, the distance, uh, sorry, the, the time it took for that bomb to hit the water indicates to me that it's a very similar depth. I'm just going to cast that a little bit harder, a bit further and just get a feel for that. Yeah, a couple of seconds. Same again, just drag the bottom and there's a little bit more silt there. It's a smoother, so when you're pulling it back, just look for the did 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 it like that as the bomb is coming over an hard surface or if it's a steady pull and you get more of a bend in your tip, that usually means it's dragging through silt. So that's a great way of mapping out your swim. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm busting to get fishing, so let's start. So we're going to start off, and because it's still fairly cold, uh, the fish, it's not that long ago that this place were covered in ice. And the fish probably aren't in what I call summer mode. Um, I'm sure they're not. We're just going to start off dead steady, right? Because there's, a, there's an old saying that you can always put it in, but you can't take it out. So all I've done is I've took, I'm just going to make a fan adjustment, I've taken a small smooth down feeder and a little bit of ground bait, a couple of dead maggots and a couple of micros. So I've not really put any bait in, a single maggot on the hook and let's just feel our way into the session because I think that's the right way to approach today. What an incredible place. Bastard is. That's actually first cast. Put the rod in the rest. I've got a single maggot on, and it's gone straight round. And it feels like a resident skimmer. Nice soft action on that ten foot rod. But you'll notice the positivity of the bite, and I can feel every single lunge of that fish. A nice skimmer. I'll just wait for all the passing traffic. We've got planes, trains, and automobiles today. I mean, look at that. It looks like it's just been born. Absolutely stunning skimmer of eight to ten ounces. I'll give myself 10 ounces for that. Cracking fish. First cast, which kind of echoes what I said, that we don't know what we're going to be looking at, so why, why plough a load of bait in? So we'll just repeat that process, dead simple, single maggot, and an odd micro, and a couple of dead maggots. Because before we start ploughing bait, which is going to be brilliant, let's just feel his way in. As I said to you in sort of the setup, that the skimmers here can be notorious for being difficult to catch. And I don't mean 
they don't feed, that's the problem, they do. They feed really well. And sometimes you can have them feeding too much, too many fish in your peg. So it's about controlling your swim and fishing efficiency, if you want to call it that, is about how many casts you make and how many fish you land. And it's dead exciting to get loads and loads of fish in your swim, but you can be a busy, full, missing bites, striking at liners, foul looking fish. So by controlling your swim, by controlling your bait, it means that you can actually catch fish more efficiently. Cast in, you get a proper bite, there's not too many fish in your peg, which results in less bites for more fish, less cast for more fish. So let's just feel our way into that. So you saw how positive that first bite was, which leads me straight into one of the fundamental uh, reasons why detection is exactly why it's made like it is. And it's a low stretch mono. And I think the primary reason, in my opinion, that we wanted it to be low stretch is purely for bite detection. And that means that there's less stretch between your feeder and your tip. So when you get a bite, like that one look, or not, or not as the case may be, you see a lot more movements, which means you can read what's happening in your swim. Because if you've got a really stretchy mono, first of all, when you cast, you finish up with a big ball because when the feed is landing and the wind's got your line, the stretch means you can't pull the, the line tight and sink your line and get the ball out of the way. So with a low stretch line, like detection, when you go in like that, it sinks, you can tension up to it and it pulls out what little ball you'll have and you're fishing and you're fishing more direct. That is the primary function of detection, is the fact that it's low stretch. Not only does the low stretch uh, aid, aid uh, bite detection, but it also aids casting because when you're casting, you need control, you need feel. So when you're going back with your rod, to cast, you need to compress your rod. So the more stretch you have in a line, the more you're actually casting the stretch rather than casting the feeder. So the beauty of this line is it does away with that and it means that you actually get more power transferred from your arms through your rod into the cast. Fantastic advantage. Then, there you go, and then, Another advantage to being low stretch is that when you are casting it and you hit your clip, you've not got the feeder traveling beyond after you've hit your clip, stretching your line, and then what I think actually happens, especially if you're casting long distances, it stretches your line, and as the feeder hits the, the, the water, the stretch is then recoiled, and it brings the feeder back towards you. And with detection, you lit your clip, the lack of stretch means that your rod comes into play, drop your rod and you're fishing. That also eliminates what I've just mentioned earlier is a bow in your line. So you've got ultimate control. So we've just had two fish in first two casts and the first thing I'm going to do is actually drop down a feeder size and I'm going to explain why. Because I didn't expect to be casting in that often. So I started off on a small, small round and I've just dropped it down to a mini because if we're going to be getting bites that quick and I've already explained about creating too much bait in your peg then we don't really want to be going in that often with a, a big feeder so that is probably something from experience that I've learnt, we've not really put any bait in yet, but already we've put two feederfuls of ground bait in. And I think that can actually drive the fish um, quite wild. So I've just dropped it down and we'll see how we get on with that. If we continue to get bites, then we know we're doing the right thing. If the bites slow up, then we can always move back. But I don't want to keep putting ground bait into the swim and creating too much activity and getting the fish too excited. So you'll be able to see, looking at that tip, that it's got quite a bit of a bend in it now and that's because of the tow that we were speaking about earlier. So as I said, the, the wind is coming down the lake and because it's so shallow, it doesn't take much to turn that water over and create an undertow. 
And that's why line choice, when you're thinking about uh, your fishing, is really important. Now, I suppose this is a fairly, uh, what's the word, not, it's not delicate, but it's not an industrial way of fishing because we're fishing for fish that can be shy biters uh, and they can be quite finicky and you need soft rods and small hooks. So, in essence, do you then need a fairly light tip? The problem with that then is that the toe will bend your tip. So if you're fishing uh, in this style and you want to try and make sure that you've got your balanced tackle, then if you're using the lightest tip, you need to use the thinnest line, which I spoke about earlier. So line diameter choice is really important. Now, we probably could have got away with um, a lower diameter here, and which would be a four pound breaking strain. But I think we've got to be realistic and say, well, you know, it's going to take a bit of stick. We're going to be casting quite often. And you heard me mention about the wear and tear on the line. So it's not always about the breaking strain when you're pulling against a fish because my line's going to snap. For me personally, the choice of diameter is more important than the choice of breaking strain, but the two come together. So we've chosen this R20, but you'll see I've got that bending my tip from the toe. So the lower diameter I can use, the less effect the toe will have onto my tip. So it's important. So just something I was thinking about then when I was just setting my tip after that cast is, you set up your rod position and where everything sits. And I suppose some of the old fishers as often as me takes it all for granted, but you need to be comfortable. Uh, obviously we've got side trays around us. Most people that will suffice, I'm just one, but I like one over here. So I can put, this is all for my bait, and then I usually have tackle hooks, spare feeders and things on the other side. But more importantly is your feeder arm and your butt rest, because that determines where your rod is. So make sure that you're comfortable, because I think that affects how you catch fish. So I've got everything off, because I'm right-handed, everything off to my right-hand side, and I've got this butt rest that kicks the back of my rod away from me, so that I've not got my rod in the way of my arms and my, and my legs. And then the front rest is far, far enough away to support the rod, and it reduces the amount of bounce and wind uh, affliction on, on the tip so it keeps you a nice steady tip so you can watch what you're doing and I think it's dead important to make sure that you're comfortable and then secondly because sometimes you'll see me with my rod in my lap where I've got the butt of the rod across here and that's usually when I'm hitting shy biting fish like roach and things like that with bites a little bit faster um, but in this instance I'm just going to wait until I get what I consider to be a proper bite because when there's a lot of fish in your peg, you'll get little indications and little liners. And when you've got your rod in your uh, lap, you're more tempted to strike. So it might be a simple tip, and it might be obvious to a lot of people, but by putting your rod like that, it's not just for comfort, so I could eat my sandwiches and drink my cup of tea. It's actually to stop me striking. So get the rod in the rest, get it dead comfortable, get it on the tip, and by the time you've reached your rod, look at indication, you might actually have recognised that it's a liner and not a bite, and you leave your rod where it is, because the more you cast, the more bait you're going to be introducing, you lose control of your swim. So that's just a great tip that serves more than comfort. So we're into fish on this short line, ground bait feeder tactics, lovely skimmers. In fact, there's another one. That doesn't feel like a skimmer at all. So I've just reached for my clip, but I think I've got away with it. And I thought it were odd, because I'd cast in then, I had a couple indications and no bite, and the bites have all been very, very quick. And that one didn't go, so the reason being, because there's a, a bigger fish in the swim, which is this. And that reinforces why we use a softish rod so that if we do get any surprises which I don't know if this is a stocky or an F1 the rod will soak up the extra lunges now we've already said that detection is a low stretch mono 
it's not a zero stretch mono like a braid which has no stretch whatsoever and what we've actually done is we've put just enough stretch into this line so that you get all the advantages casting accuracy bite detection and fish control without disadvantage of having zero stretch which makes it really versatile and ideal for mixed fisheries like this fantastic place that we're at today I'm just going to up that up so we don't get in a mess and I'll just show you him because he's an absolutely stunning fish and that proves that just with the balance between the low stretch and just enough stretch means that you can land absolute stunners like that while still getting the advantages of bite detection. So it seems that we've landed on the right tactics, which, listen, doesn't happen every time, but today, I mean, look at that, what a beautiful fish. He's a good two and a half pound. Might even give himself 212 for it. So we're catching fish, which is fantastic, and they're the sort of tactics that you need. So I'm gonna just catch a few more, and we'll just keep fishing like this, and if anything changes, we'll tune you back in, and we'll, uh, we'll show you what we're doing. So we've been catching with lovely, at nice, rate of fish, good skimmers, but then the last few fish um, have been a bit smaller and I've actually noticed that the indications are different and the bites are certainly different and you know we, we're getting a lot more taps and knocks and not clean pull rounds like we were getting before with them good sized fish. So what I've deducted from that is that a different stamp of fish has moved in so I don't know if the big fish have backed off for some reason and allowed them little fish into the dinner table if you like but it's certainly changed so I'm just considering changing what I'm going to do um, but I'm conscious of as I said earlier um, the fact that because I want to put some bait in is what my mind's saying to me but I'm also conscious that the small fish will probably go absolutely mental if I start ploughing bait in but I think it's important to experiment and see if you can bring about some changes rather than just sort of sitting here waiting for the small fish to pass and the big ones to come back because we've had a great you know early part of the session by not being by not feeding so it's time to start changing it up a bit but I'm actually thinking about putting pellets in and a little pinch of worms um, as opposed to sort of maggots and worms because I'm thinking if I'm trying to attract a bigger stamp of fish fewer than micros that means there's less particles and um, and the user sorts out a few better fish does that so that's probably going to be my next move so what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to clip that feeder that we started on and introduce a little bit of bait into that swim and because I can't help myself so I've just put a few micros, a good pinch, almost enough to fill, half fill the feeder, big pinch of worms, and just wedged all them in. And I'm going to put a couple of feederfuls like that in, leave that to settle, and I'm going to go out onto that method line that we clipped up for early on that uh, or the rod, just empty that feeder out. So I'm just going to put that little bit of bait in. So I'm setting it up, if you like, ready for if I want to come back on it. We'll have had some fish. I wouldn't introduce that much bait in one go if I were going to stay on it. Let's say I just wanted to fish this method, I'd creep a bit of bait in. Whereas in this, what I'm actually doing here is injecting quite an amount of bait because I'm going to leave it so it'll give it a chance to settle because I think 
that will attract fish, but it will also make the peg a little busy. Just let that, just let that feeder soak a little bit, just before you check it out. I don't like to strike at my feeder when I'm emptying it. I like to just, you'll just see me there, just get a little shake and wobble it a little bit. Because that is, I think it leaves the bait in the swim rather than striking at it and it blowing it all up and scattering it everywhere. So just a little shake. I see a lot of people doing that and I don't always think it's right. So let's have a chuck out of the method and see if there's any bigger fish waiting for us. So we'll just load that feeder up with pellets with a wafter. And that just landed perfectly. That's around 55 meters, somewhere between 55 and 60. And there's a lovely breeze on. And you'll see that that line has sunk straight under the surface, which is another advantage of, of this line. It's, it's a sinking line, which is a massive advantage when you've got a skim on it like this. And it's not particularly deep, so it's not always easy to sink your line on the shallow venue. But the fact that we have less stretch in it, when you hit your clip, you're not getting that big ball because there's no stretch. So it cuts through the surface and it's straight down and you're fishing straight away. Now, I've not seen any carp moving, which you sometimes do here. And there is a bit of a chill in this wind, so I'm not really sure if it'll be quite as productive, but nonetheless, it's a great way to catch fish micros on that banjo feeder. Nice and patient, get your rod comfortable. You know that your trap's set. So that feeder should be working as it should. I've not overloaded it with pellets because obviously it's still cold. So I've squeezed some pellets in firm in the bottom and then I've just trapped my outlet on top with as few pellets as I can get away with. So it just holds that bait and I'm expecting they've probably now broken off and I should actually be fishing with a nice little pile of pellets and that six mil land them up bait in the middle. Uh, and I was just about to tell you that the first thing I noticed is the lack of tow. So my tip were quite slack, not bent round. Now considering that when we were fishing on the short line, there were quite an amount of tow, and I'd only got 20 metres of line out, but here we've got sort of 55 plus metres of line, and there were no tow, and that's due to that wind that I said had changed direction. This feels like a, a skimmer. Um, but nonetheless, it's a nice fish. Cracking bite at that distance, and I think that's just testament to the advantages of this low stretch mono. And that's had that six mil yellow wafter. Yeah, it's a skimmer. And I've not gone for a big hook, I've just gone for a 16, which is just enough to hold that bandum down because, of course, always check and it's always check that um, nice fish. I mean, if you caught one of them every cast, you'd be happy, wouldn't you? When you do put your bandum or your wafter or whatever it is that you're using. Just make sure that it's not too buoyant, that it lifts you 
hook off the bottom. So I just have a little tub of water in this bowl here and I can see that that's actually sinking. And that's a great little tip. Just make sure that your bait's not overpowering your hook weight. And that, because of the control we've got with that line, that's just making casting a lot easier. And you just see me hit my clip, and just when you hit your clip, try and hit your clip back here, and then just lower your feeder in. And what that, I think, what that enables it to do is, when it stops in the air, it just straightens itself out, and is then you let, let go with your rod. So you've hit your clip, and just lean forward, and it means that your feeder will fall and sit in, in my opinion, bottom down, so it lands. It's not going to knock all your bait off, and I think you've got an increased uh, chance then of your method fishing better because it should land exactly how you packed it before you cast it and you just you can tell with the sound of the feeder it sits of water it's more of a, a plop than a crash and the beauty of this line is with the lack of stretch you've got more control so when you hit your clip you can feel it and you're not getting that like elastic band effect that you'll get with a really stretchy mono ideal for this kind of fishing The first thing that I've noticed, and you'll probably have noticed, is that they're completely different fish. We'd left that short line catching skimmers, small, smaller fish. But this method with micros definitely attracts a better stamp of fish. And here's another one. Lovely bass and skimmers. Just take your time. And you'll notice that it was another great bite, and as I picked up, I got contacted immediately by that fish. So we're enjoying some good sport on it. Be interesting to see if any fish have turned up on that short line. And with a bit of luck, sport will continue. Cracking fish. And that feels like another good skimmer. Bream in some people's opinions. And we've not had any F1s or carp out there, which can happen, but like I said, I've not seen any moving. But the beauty of fishing like this, where we've got a sensible sized hook bait and hook, means that we have got a chance of catching other fish. So important to Leave yourself the opportunity. You know, we could have sat here with a great big hook on and a great big up bait, an eight mil pellet or a great big wafter. But I think if a carp or an F1 comes into your swim, you'll still catch them on a six mil. But the beauty of this is, A, we're catching fish, and B, we're also feeding a swim. So if one does rock up, We'll catch them anyway. I mean, they're not to be sniffed at. He's nearer three pound than he isn't. So, it's a cracking method. I think what we'll do is we'll drop back onto that short line to see if, you know, that's perfect hooking, that is right in the bottom lip, just to see if any fish have turned up on that bait that we put in before we went on the method. So I've just put that method down and I picked my short rod back up but before I chuck it out I'm just going to take that slightly bigger feeder off because of course before we went on the method I put them two feederfuls of bait in which had pellets and so on this first cast here I'm actually just going to plug that feeder with ground bait and when I say plug it what I'm actually doing is squeezing it quite a bit harder than I normally would because I want to just fish 
over the top of that little pile of bait that we put in and not actually add any more bait to it because I think that the fish will be over the top of that because in my mind we've put that bait in and as we've emptied it it's kind of spread over a bit of an area but I think the fish will have been in, into that pushing it around, picking it up, dropping it wafting the tails and doing all that sort of carry on and they'll have spread that bait around a little bit so there'll be an area with an odd bit of that worm and an odd pellet here so I'm now just going to chuck this little target you know, my, my wedged up feeder into the middle of that and hope that while they're grazing they'll just pick up my up bait i.e. not adding to the feed and with a little bit of luck there'll be a few fish to be caught on that and you know, we're looking at approaching this day's fishing and how do we get the most of it and I've gone out there to just demonstrate that you can catch fish in different ways from the same peg um, if you put that into a match fishing scenario that would be about maximising the options that you've got from a peg so you might rest a swim, go and catch some fish out there come back, you might build a swim up you might hope to catch bigger fish um, on your on your other swim if you were trying to build a match weight but if you're pleasure fishing like sort of like what we are today then it's just about enjoying it and you might want to fish out there casting a bit further and but you might want to fish like I'm fishing here so just trying to demonstrate to you that you can catch fish on in both areas um, but in, di in different ways so a great little insight into how I think I would approach them two, you know, the two different swims. Nice light tip with that low stretch line, just showing me everything that's happening in my peg. Brilliant for reading your swim. And that just waited because I had a few little knocks and taps. It don't feel like a big fish. Just wait for it to be a proper positive bite before you pick up. And that's what's sitting, not sitting on your hands like Ivan Marsh used to say, but having your rod in the rest rather than having it in your lap. That's what it enables you to do, just a little skim a lot. It just enables you to wait until the fish is on. A cracking little fish. Perfectly formed. and we'll just try and catch another one. And that were a more positive bite. And it feels like another good skimmer. So we've had cracking day today, filming our new product, Detection Line. And we've talked you through how we went about designing it and how to use it and showing you the applications of why we've actually made detection what it is but that is a great example skimmer fishing short a method feeder fishing long it's a great day out and a great showcase So this is my 10 foot rod setup, which is um, a long enough rod to fish, in my opinion, up to about 30 metres, um, especially if it's not too windy and you're not trying to cast too big a feeder, this will cover you for everything. It's nice and short, which means when you bring your fish in, you can get them close to your net, just a little bit easier to use. And that's why I choose a 10 foot rod. I've actually got a 520 extremity attached to that. Now, some people might say that's really big, but most of my reels are actually this size because I do a lot of different varied fishing, so this reel will do both, whereas uh, a good old saying um, is a small reel can't do a big reel's job, but a big reel can do a small reel's job. The only difference is comfort, or if you're that kind of person you want things to match, then you might feel that way. But for me personally, that works for me. That's loaded with the new line, which is, this is actually 020, 
five pound uh, braking strain. You'll see that's nicely loaded up as, as far up to the lip as you're comfortable. Me personally, I like to load my uh, reels right up to the top because I think that aids casting, you get less drag, and it just, it's a better all round experience and a better performance really, I suppose, if you're trying to get technical. Um, and that's just direct. Five pounds should be strong enough to catch skimmers and F1s. Now, you might say, well, why not thicker? And what I'm gonna say to you is, it's a bit of a rule of thumb that I've got that applies to all these videos because we're not trying to tell you how to fish we're just telling you how we fish and then you can take that information away with you and apply it to your fishing so the rule of thumb is that you probably try and use the thinnest line that you can get away with and the reason is because of casting and uh, it sinks through the water you get less drag and it's just a lot better for performance wise but if you want to use a six pound because you want to have a bit more of a buffer, a bit more of a safety net, then six pound would be fine. But of course, once you start getting thicker, if you try to go for further distances, it won't, it won't work as well. So that's why I choose that particular diameter. That's threaded straight through, and what I mean by that is there's no shock leader, because you'll hear top people talking about shock leaders. There's no need for that with the sort of feeders that I'm using and the distance. And of course, with the short rod, you're not really going to be trying to cast that far, so you don't need uh, you, know, you don't need things like shop leaders. And then down at the business end, because it's a commercial fishery, the feeder has to be free running. And basically, that is just on a snap link swivel, which I've got running up and down the line. And then this ter is terminated with, I suppose you call it my standard free running rig. Now I've done a video on this separately, um, which you can see on this link here. If you want to click on that but basically that's big overhand loop tied back cut off and it creates a knot which I just put a number eight stock onto the line to trap my feeder and what happens is you cast it off that and that's a nice 250 millimeters or a foot in all money of the main line down to a loop where it'll attach my hook length dead simple rig nice and easy tangle free and it'll serve you well and to that rig, I'm going to add my hook length. Now, I use a loop-to-loop -loop system, and on the end of the feeder rig is a loop of around an inch. And the reason why I use uh, long loops, or if, if you consider that to be a long loop, is that A, it's a nice big loop so you can put your rig on easy, but B, I find that that then lays flat, which means that it doesn't create as much spin when you're retrieving your feeder. So a similar sort of thing in the end of the hook length, so two loops. I pass the loop, of the rig through the loop of the hook length and then I basically pass the hook through the loop of the main line and the reason I do that is because that creates a figure of eight and as I pull that together that doesn't nip up and makes that a stronger connection so I'll just pull it down nice and tight you can wet that if you want and just give it a little nip and that is a dead simple rig and I'm using B911 16s and 14s and the reason why I've got two is because I'll have maggots on the 16s and possibly worms on a 14 and that's tied to O13 line because we might it's nice and coloured I think that'll be thin enough to get bites and we might hook a big fish so the second setup that I've got is um, a 12 foot rod this is my 12 foot setup and this is uh, a more powerful rod and slightly longer obviously other one's 10 foot this is 12 and it's got a bit more power in the bottom. It's still soft enough to play bream and F1s and small carp, but powerful enough to cast me further distance. So here, I believe that the F1s and the carp will sit further out. Usually it can be anything from about 40 to 60, 60 meters. Um, we came recently and all the fish were on, there were a wind off our back here and all the fish were sat on that warm wind. So just watch out for signs where fish are moving, if they're topping, because carp show they actually show themselves and then use that as a guide if you don't see fish topping just think about um, the area in front of you and understand that most fish back off uh, they don't always come to you especially when it's cold like this and they'll they'll show up so I think um, we've not seen any yet but I think they'll actually be sat they'll be sat further out so this rod as I said it's got a bit more power once again as I mentioned earlier, I've got a 520 uh, extremity reel, and this one's loaded with six pound line, and that's a little bit beefier. Now that is strong enough and durable enough to cast off 
And the beauty of this line is that it's very, very hard wearing with its hard surface. So it means that when the feeder's rubbing up and down here, because I actually think people say, oh, my line snapped. No, it didn't snap. It's actually worn through and it's parted. So you don't always need the braking strain, you need the durability. And that means, for me, thickness. So the O23, that's a six pound braking strain. And that's its not strength. So, again, I won't need a shock leader because I won't be going gung-go. I won't be trying to break the world record for distance casting. And this will carry me nice and easy to that sort of distance. Now, the other thing about diameters is the fact that when you get a shallow lake like this, you get, and there's a wind and it's blowing from right to left. And that creates tow. So the wind is pushing this way and that turns the whole of the lake over and it means the undercurrent is coming the other way. And that will give you drag on your line. So that's one of the reasons why I like to fish the thinnest I can fish. And we'll talk about what we do for further distances and um, more powerful casting and when we're trying to go to extreme distances because we'll talk about shot leaders then but in this instance the six pound or 23 is strong enough to get us where we need to be but thin enough so we're not getting too much drag but thick enough so we don't get rub throughs and get line parting bottom of that is an inline banjo feeder that's a 45 grammer and i've just got a four inch up length because i think that four inches is the right length to catch uh, big bream, F1s and carp. If you were fishing for F1s, you might shorten that down to three inch, let's say, but I think for big carp and skimmers, it needs to be four. So we've, what we've done is we've, we've gone for the, if you like, majority, the majority rule. And I've got a little tip what I do with the hook lens, which if you just keep watching, you'll see that, how I shorten hook lens down on the bank. So that is, you know, the, the medium uh, distance setup. And I'll talk you, through my spare rod which hopefully won't have to use but I've actually got it set up on my side tray in case we do. So here's the hook length that I were talking about and when I'm tying these at home to give myself uh, more versatility I actually tie the hair rigs onto a longer length so that I can use them for bomb fishing or pellet waggler for instance or any kind of air rigging where I might need a longer length but then what that allows me to do is when I'm on the bank if I want to use a four inch I can actually just measure it off, like so, and just tie that off in a loop so that I don't have to tie 4 inch hook lengths, 3 inch hook lengths, 10 inch hook lengths and 15 inch hook lengths. I basically tie them all to 15 inch and then adjust them down. Now if I'm going into a match where I need preparation, I'll pre-shorten some or I'll actually tie some short. Now you might buy your um, hook lens pre-tied, as a lot of people do, but if you buy the longer ones, you can do what I've just done and shorten them down, so it just gives you more versatility, whereas if you only buy the four inch ones, you can't use them on a pellet waggler for instance, so that's a nice little tip for you that I think will give you more variation for less work. Now, this is the big rod, and this is a different animal altogether, so you'll see there's a different reel on this to start with. And that's because this reel has got a bigger spool. And that's my reasoning, if I can catch this in the wind, that's my reasoning for not having what the same reel as what I've got in the other two. Because I want to use this for casting further distances. <clears throat> so this is a 720. So it's a nice big spool, which means that when you're casting, the line will come off the spool a lot easier. It's also got a better retrieve because you don't want to be winding a little reel all the way back from a long distance. Now to this one I've actually got O20 and five pound main line. Now that sort of contradicts straight away what we've just said about the medium rod because that's six pound. But the reason being is I'm casting further so I want the thinner diameter and the lighter weight of the O20 line so it doesn't create drag. Not only for the drag that we're talking about with the undertow but the drag when you're casting. So a nice thin line will peel off your reel a lot easier and it'll aid for distance. So what have I done to make that five pound line work at that sort of distance? Well, we've put a shock leader on. Now, shock leaders are an interesting thing. Um, not for everybody, some people don't like them. And some people will say, well, it's an extreme thing. But while we're doing it and while we're on this venue, I'll talk you through it. So what do we mean by a shock leader? 
Well, basically, it's a length of line that runs from your rig, from where your feeder sits, up, in this instance, up through your rod, back down your rod, and just onto your spool. And the line I've chosen is actually the same line as we've got on the reel. And the reason for that will become clear when we start talking about this particular line later on, but it's a nice low stretch mono. This one in particular is an O28 and a £10 braking strain. And we spoke earlier about when we're putting power into a cast, we want durability. So you're going to get a lot more pressure around the feeder where the line, where the feeder sits on the line, when you're punching a feeder with power. So the thickness of the line, obviously, will stand up to that test. When you're winding fish back from that distance, you're going to get a lot more up and down with your feeder, and the abrasion resistance will stop that from parting. But moreover, when you are really giving it the beans, as I say, you don't want that line to part because it's too thin. So I've chosen 10 pound or 28. An eight pound might do you, and I would probably do that if I were bring fishing. But we can't fish in, and I could finish up with a 60 gram feeder on here. So I've just gone a little bit stronger with the 10 pound or 28, because I think that is right for this particular job. Bait, you can't fish without it. I'm just gonna talk you through, obviously, what I've brought today to cover what I think are the options that we need. So the skimmers and there's bream. So ground bait for me is essential. I'm not always saying that that is the answer, but you need it. So I've gone for a dark, low fish meal mix, which in this instance is F1 dark and Thatcher's mixed together in a 60, 40 uh, ratio, which gives me enough strength, but not too strong where it's putting off all the skimmers. I've then got pellets, which you'll see further down the video, how I've prepared those. They're two mil micros, so they'll fit onto a banjo or a method. And I might even introduce a few of those through the feeder when I'm fishing for skimmers. Of course, no fishing session is complete without a few maggots. But then today, something I think could be quite important is worms. And just dendrobenas, which I've not quite chopped yet, but we'll have them because I think uh, it's been warm and the water's coloured and they're a, what I call a scent bait and they've got a lot of meat in them, a lot of protein. And I think when it's warm, the fish are thinking about feeding, they're moving about a bit more. There's a nice chop on. So I think that could be quite a positive, uh, what I call an aggressive bait. So it might not be bimbling uh, where we have to be dead negative. Might need to put some bait in. I've got a few dead maggots, which I think are always handy to go through in your feeder because they lay on the bottom nice. And because I'd got some opened from a previous session, I brought some corn. And the reason why I've done that is because, as I've just said, sometimes you just want a negative approach and an odd target bait. And if you start filling your swim with these skimmers there, they're notorious because it's soft bottom, they become difficult to catch. So sometimes a more particle based approach is better than piling loads of bait in and driving them crackers. So I'm going to run you through pellets because they're one of the most important uh, baits at commercial fishery, especially this one. So this is how I do mine. And basically I have a clip lock tub. This one is around uh, three quarters of a litre, which I believe is just over a pint, pint and a half. And what I've done is this morning, very early before I set off on my journey, I fill that with dry pellets and then I fill that to the brim with water. Put the lid on which basically stops the pellets from swelling and it also means that all the water because the pellets can't swell finds its way through every single pellet and it keeps the integrity of the pellet now don't be alarmed when it, they don't come out of the tub and i'm just going to use all my strength to give that tub a squeeze and tap out those pellets because they're wedged in get your finger in scoop it all out and I can tell, as I'm putting my fingers in, that all the pellets have all got the same sort of moisture. And out they come. I give them a little rub round, and you'll see inside the tub that every single one of them pellets looks exactly the same. They're damp enough to squeeze, so if you want to put them on a mould, you can do. But they're dry enough, so they don't stick together. They've not clogged up, and I believe each pellet it's got the same amount of moisture in, and that is a foolproof way of preparing your pellets. Dead simple. So we've had a stunning day here at Barston, catching gorgeous fish like that. And if you've enjoyed this and you want to see similar videos, just click here, because we've got some for you.